Everybody, we are coming to the end of a week that's changed our lives profoundly. The week before that, I think we would have said, was a week that changed our lives profoundly, and next week will be even more so. We're, we're dealing with something we've never dealt with before. None of us has experienced. We are all together trying to figure out how to deal with a new reality, and that will be something we grapple with together for weeks and months to come. So I just want to start by saying for everyone, it's important to recognize uh, the distance we've had to travel in very, very little time. We've had to get used to things that were literally unimaginable. And we didn't get months to get ready. We only had days to change our habits and our lives profoundly. Anyone out there who's confused, you are absolutely in the vast majority with the rest of us. We're all trying to make sense of so much new information, so many new challenges, and trying to figure out the right way to do this together. I'll be talking today about clearer, uh, specific ideas about how we will work together within the new pause order uh, from the state of New York. I'll be talking about the ways we're going to work together to get through the weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'm going to be very clear about challenges. I think my job is to tell you the things that we're going to confront, including some things that are difficult to hear, but to brace New Yorkers for the reality, to get you all informed honestly about what we're dealing with and what we will deal, will deal with, but also to remind you of our strengths, of all the help uh, that people are giving each other, all the help our city government can and will give, our state government can and will give, all the people who are stepping forward, not only in New York City, but all over the country, all over the world, who want to help New York City right now, and God bless them all. I'll talk about all that today and in the days ahead. But really, it is important to recognize the sheer extent of change and to understand how challenging that is for all of us as human beings to make sense of so quickly. If anyone is feeling anxious or fearful, that is entirely normal at this moment. And what's so important is to talk it through with each other and seek you know, good and real and accurate information, which we will provide constantly, to support each other, listen to each other's concerns, see how we can help, particularly how we can help those in greatest need. And that's what New Yorkers do so well. We've seen it time and time again, after 9-11, after Sandy, so many times, when seniors needed help, folks with disabilities, uh, folks who didn't have medicine, uh, folks who couldn't get out of their apartment. Uh, time and time again, everyday New Yorkers answered the call. And we're going to need that again. And we're going to be at this again for weeks and months. But I'll tell you something, I, I really believe that even though we are the epicenter of this crisis, and I want to be real, real honest about that, we are now in New York City the epicenter of this crisis in the United States of America. I am not happy to tell you that, and you're not happy to hear it. But I'll tell you something else. There is no place in the United States of America, no place on earth, where there are stronger, tougher, more resilient people where there is more spirit and compassion, uh, this is the place where people can handle anything thrown at them. That's who New Yorkers are. That's who all of you are. And that gives me a lot of hope. And I've been real honest about the fact that uh, I'm not satisfied by our nation's response to this crisis. I don't feel that there's been anywhere near the response that any place in this nation deserves, especially our nation's largest city with 8.6 million people on the front line. But I, at the same time as I am deeply concerned and troubled and angry and frustrated at the lack of federal response, I am inspired by the response right here in New York City from everyday New Yorkers, from our public servants, from all the people who protect us and keep us healthy, so many good people who are stepping up, and I'm inspired because I believe if there's one place on earth that has the ingenuity and the creativity and the sense of entrepreneurship to find a way to overcome this crisis with our own resources, that's right here. Now, 
I want to be 100% clear, that doesn't let the federal government off the hook in the least. I couldn't be angrier at the lack of response. I've been very plain about that. But you know what? If we are going to be left to fend for ourselves in New York City and New York State, well, I can at least say there are no people on earth who are more creative and more able to create something out of even the most tough circumstances. No one's better than New Yorkers. We're going to find a way to do things we've never done before. And I've likened this situation to war many times because it is. That's just a reality, and we've only begun down this very difficult path. But I already see New Yorkers doing extraordinary things. I already see people volunteering to find the supplies we need, to build the equipment we need, to make things happen, even when previously we would have thought it impossible. Isn't that the history of New York City in a nutshell? People making things happen even though they were told it was impossible. That is the story of New York and New Yorkers. So we will do it again in our time, right here, right now. Let me turn to some specific updates and information I want to share with everyone. And I want to take a moment to really commend the people who are doing exceptional work right now, helping us all. Of course, our healthcare workers, God bless them. Uh, they have such a tough job at this moment, uh, but they are showing up with uh, energy and passion, protecting the lives of so many people. Our first responders, who we, call, we, we need them every day, every year, and we need them even more now, and they are at their post doing their job brilliantly. Our transit workers, uh, we're depending on them to make sure that everyone else we need gets where they need to go. And thank you to all the transit workers for what you're doing. And then there's a lot of even more unsung heroes who really deserve notice at this moment. You know what? Maybe in the normal course of life, you don't stop to think about uh, the man or woman who works in the grocery store or the pharmacy, uh, the postal worker who brings you every day things you depend on and you're going to depend on even more now. All the delivery workers, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector, uh, the men and women who deliver food and are now working at uh, so many food establishments that are going through a tough time, but a lot of them are continuing to operate so they can help all of us. All those folks are answering the call in their own way. I want to thank all of you. Uh, we need all of you. And, and you don't get the praise you deserve normally, and you should get a whole lot of praise now because you, all of you, are helping to keep this city running, keep it together, ensuring that people who need help the most are getting it. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I want to note, and I want to ask everyone, if you see, you know, this is a time, uh, I say it a lot, that, you know, remember to thank people who do so much for us. You know, this coming week, we're going to be dealing with a whole different reality. We've never been under uh, this kind of order uh, to pause our lives, change our ways. It's going to take uh, getting used to it. It's going to take adjustments. There'll be some trial and error for sure. But let's thank the people who are helping us, helping to make it work. If you see a first responder, a police officer, a firefighter, a EMT, uh, thank them. Uh, Thank the transit workers. Thank the healthcare workers. Thank those educators who are going to be at those enrichment centers uh, taking care of the children of those essential workers. And like I said, the postal worker on your block, the person that delivers a pizza to you, anybody you come across who's out there making it happen, please give them some extra gratitude because they deserve it. Each day, I have a very unfortunate obligation to tell you the overall situation in terms of the number of cases. Uh, I remind you, every case is a human being and a family, and the numbers, again, continue to be staggering. Confirmed New York City cases at this moment, this is based on information from 10 a.m. today, 9,000. 654 cases, uh, an unbelievable number. We couldn't even imagine such a number just a week ago. We are on the verge right now of 10,000 cases in this city. We essentially at this point, and this has been a trend over recent days, we represent 
um, shockingly, about a third of the cases in the entire United States of America, and about two-thirds of the cases in the state of New York or even more. We'll ke constantly keep you updated, but I want people to just for a moment reflect on that fact. This is a crisis affecting our whole state, our whole nation, but it's a crisis affecting New York City uh, far more than any place else, just by the numbers. One third of the cases in the entire nation right here. We have lost 63 people to coronavirus in just a matter of weeks. It, we're going to constantly update you what we see within these facts to help people understand this disease better. And I remind you, it's a disease that literally no expert on earth fully understands, but we're trying to constantly confirm our understanding and update people. But here is a fact that's important. As of this moment in New York City, and this information will be published in more detail shortly, there have been, in the age group from birth to 44 years old, so New Yorkers from the first moments of life up to 44 years old, within that group there have been no deaths. And that is a very important fact, uh, confirming a lot of what we understood previously about this virus. The breakdown by borough. Brooklyn is 2,857 cases, Queens 2,715, Manhattan 2,072, the Bronx 1,411, and Staten Island 593. Another very important point, and again, information will be uh, updated constantly and made public when we can, but we've talked a lot, and I reflected a few days ago about a conversation I had with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the leading national expert uh, in this crisis and who we all are turning to for important information. He's also a proud son of Brooklyn, proud son of New York City. Uh, he, days ago, said to me, we really need to educate people to the particular danger to those over 70 years old. Well, here's what we know in New York City so far. 35% of our hospitalizations related to coronavirus have been for New Yorkers who are over 70, 35%, over a third. But you should also know that people over 70 constitute only about 10% of the population of New York City. So what we're seeing is the over 70-year-olds represented among those hospitalized over three times more than their proportion of the population. Uh, that really reminds us that that's the particular thing we need to focus on. Folks who are much older, and particularly if they have those pre-existing conditions we've talked about so much. These are the folks in the greatest danger who we have to really move heaven and earth to protect, uh, keeping them uh, isolated and out of contact with other people to the maximum amount uh, possible, supporting them, still giving them a lot of love and support, uh, phone calls, FaceTime, everything you can do to support your older loved ones, getting them the things they need, but keeping them out of contact with others to the maximum extent possible to protect them. That's crucial. I'm going to talk for a moment about uh, the situation with other levels of government, and it is ever there was a tale of two cities, this is it. The state of New York is doing so many uh, wonderful things, so many of the right things to help people all over the state and certainly to help New York City. I commend uh, Governor Cuomo and our legislative leaders in Albany, Speaker Hasty and Majority Leader Stuart Cousins, and so many people across the state government who are doing so much to help New York City right now. And on the federal side, it's almost exactly the opposite, where we're seeing so little. That is not to say there are not good people in the federal government trying to help us. And Dr. Fauci is a great example, and so many of the good men and women at FEMA are a great example. It's not one way or another. But when it comes to the decisions of government and the actions of government, really doing something tangible, we're seeing a lot of help from the state of New York and very little in the way of evidence that the federal government understands that our nation's largest city is in the crosshairs and that the federal government is going to actually do something about it. I won't dwell. I've been perfectly clear. We need our armed forces, and we need them now. And I'm very happy that we're getting uh, the ship, the Comfort, 
uh, coming to New York soon. That's very, very helpful. That's a great example of what our armed forces could do, but they could do so much more if they were fully mobilized, and we need them. Uh, we need uh, supplies on a vast scale for this city. Uh, we are very happy that FEMA is here. Uh, that could make a difference, but so far we have no specifics on what supplies we will get when, and we need them now. Uh, I have, again, to compare great appreciation for the announcement that Governor Cuomo made yesterday, a million more N95 masks coming to New York City soon. That's crucial. That's wonderful. But I have no such announcement from the President of the United States. In fact, he still has not uh, fully utilized the Defense Production Act. He has not given orders to specific companies to not only produce those items that are needed most, starting with ventilators, but to ensure that they will be distributed to where the need is greatest here in New York and other key parts of the country. I believe that can't be done and won't be done uh, unless and until our military is mobilized. And I don't know why on earth the, the president hesitates at this point. I think you're seeing a hue and cry all over the country uh, for our armed forces to be activated. The time is now. Very quickly, and this has been put out publicly yesterday, I'll just give a brief overview, a uh, number of personnel announcements. We are continuing to build out our team to deal with what is a wartime type of crisis. Uh, I want to thank for her extraordinary leadership, my chief of staff, Emma Wolf. And I announced yesterday that I will add uh, to her title the designation of deputy mayor for administration and that will put her second in the line of succession after our first deputy mayor, Dean Fulahan. Both of them have been <clears throat> the paramount outstanding leaders of the day-to-day -day operations uh, that are being run out of our Office of Emergency Management and other locations coordinating all the work of all city agencies. Uh, we, all of us, uh, even though we're working remotely from each other in many cases, we are talking constantly throughout the day. I am being given every hour, literally, it seems, uh, new decisions to make, and I'm determining the direction of the city's response, but I have extraordinary leaders to depend on to implement those decisions and to coordinate the work of all of our agencies. So a tremendous thank you to First Deputy Mayor Dean Fulahan and now a Deputy Mayor for Administration and Chief of Staff Emma Wolf. I announced that we will have uh, one of our most extraordinary public servants, our Sanitation Commissioner, Catherine Garcia, will take on an additional title as our COVID-19 food czar. Uh, this is a brand new concept, and it reflects the reality of what we're dealing with today. Uh, we hope to get good news from Washington of some kind of true stimulus package uh, that will actually reach the people of this city and this country with substantial uh, direct support, not token support, not one-time support, but deep ongoing support so folks can afford everything in their lives. We don't have that yet, however. I'm desperately concerned that a lot of New Yorkers are running out of money, and that's the money they use to buy food, among other crucial necessities. Commissioner Garcia, in her new role, will create a citywide network to ensure that food is available to those who cannot afford it, Food is available to seniors and vulnerable folks. Food is available to people who were working just a few weeks ago and no longer have any means of support. It's going to take a mobilization such as we've never seen before. She'll work with uh, all of those agencies uh, that currently do food relief, the Human Resources Administration, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, obviously uh, state agencies, uh, food banks, soup kitchens, so many amazing nonprofit organizations, She'll work with all of them, but she's going to build something a bigger and more comprehensive than we've ever seen in New York City on the assumption that food will become much more of an issue going forward and that many people will have a strain that they have not experienced previously because of huge disruptions uh, in their own income. So I want to thank Commissioner Garcia for taking on that role. I've named uh, Peter Hatch as our COVID-19 public-private partnership czar. Uh, he will work with private sector entities and philanthropic partners to create uh, a brand new network of support. There are so many wonderful offers of help coming in. We have to build that into a truly organized, forceful effort to ensure that the maximum uh, private and philanthropic help 
reaches those in greatest need and augments everything we're trying to do as a city. Uh, Peter Hatch served previously as deputy, uh, excuse me, as chief of staff to Deputy Mayor Raul Perea Hensley. He will take on this new role as the private public, uh, public-private partnership czar. Also, coming back into city service, uh, my senior advisor for years, Gabrielle Fialkoff, who played a crucial role activating many uh, forms of support for uh, the people of this city. She did an outstanding job over five years serving the people of the city. She's returning as a senior advisor. Uh, she will ensure that many of the organizations that previously she worked with uh, to help in normal times will help even more now in these tough, tough times. And uh, replacing Peter Hatch in his role as chief of staff to the Deputy Mayor Raul Perea Hense, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, will be Julie Barrow, who has worked in our intergovernmental affairs operation, and thank her for taking on that new role. Lastly, uh, we're going to be doing something, this, uh, I'm announcing this now, something we have not had to do in our recent memory in this city, which is to uh, organize production here in New York City for vitally needed supplies and equipment. Uh, the notion of this city being left in so many ways on its own to deal with this crisis is deeply painful, but we don't take it lying down. We're going to fight for all the resources and support we deserve and need. But in the meantime, I've named Carl Rodriguez, who is currently Chief of Staff to Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean, Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development. Uh, Carl will additionally take on a role uh, running our production capacity group. This will be uh, leaders from different city agencies working with the private sector to determine to the maximum extent possible quickly, tangibly, how we will produce ventilators right here in New York City, uh, surgical masks, uh, hospital surgical gowns, anything and everything that we need. This is in no way letting the federal government off the hook. But it does say that if we can effectively produce something in New York City, even if it is not uh, exactly the ideal we would want, but it's still usable, we will produce it here. I want to thank Carl for taking on this role and all those who will be working with him. Quickly, I'll talk about some other items and then turn to our police commissioner who will give you an update. On the question of parks, I spoke earlier with Governor Cuomo. Uh, we are fully aligned. Uh, we understand that uh, we have a big and different and new challenge on our hands. Uh, folks who are going to be home in a way that literally doesn't happen any time of the year, not even in summer, uh, to have so many people home at once, so many families and so many children looking for some opportunity to get out of their homes, at least for a small portion of the day. Here's how we're going to do it, and I'm going to describe uh, what we're going to do in the first week, starting Monday and throughout this coming week. And then we're going to judge the results accordingly, and we might then make some very different plans. And again, one of the things I want to emphasize, uh, every single day, instructions can change based on new circumstances because we are dealing with something that we've never dealt with before. We're going to always try and give you clear and consistent information. But I'm also warning people, it can change. If it changes, it changes for a reason, and we'll certainly explain why. So on the parks, uh, we understand that uh, under uh, the governor's pause order, which I entirely agree with, uh, we need to ensure that if people want a little exercise in their day, uh, that they can do that the right way. It is absolutely normal and human to want to get outside, get a little bit of exercise, but I remind you, the pause is all about social distancing. It is all about protecting ourselves and our families and each other. Uh, when we say you can go out for some exercise, we are not saying you can linger. We're not saying you can make a day of it. We're saying go out, get uh, a minimum amount of exercise, get what you need, and then get back indoors. Same with grocery shopping. Go get what you need, get back inside. The guy go to the pharmacy, get what you need, get back inside. Uh, we will be enforcing this, but with uh, understanding for the challenges that people are facing, for how new this is. And I'll talk about it, and then Commissioner Shea will talk about it. We'll enforce through education. We'll enforce through warnings. Uh, we'll enforce with having real conversations with people to help them understand what's going on. We're not going to be draconian. Uh, we're going to give people a chance to get used to this. But I guarantee you we will enforce 
uh, this new reality. Uh, and I think the vast majority of New Yorkers will understand quickly and will act accordingly. So folks will go to their parks. That's normal. You want to get outside for a little bit. You want to get some exercise. You want to go for a run. Whatever it is, that's normal. You got to socially distance. You can't do it the way you're used to. You can't play team sports at this point. It's going to be, unfortunately, quite a while uh, before that's possible again. There's no more gatherings. There's no more events. There's no more big barbecues. All that is gone for now. It's not gone forever. It's gone certainly for weeks, probably for months. At some point, we'll be able to resume a more normal life. But for now, when you go to the park, you're going for your own exercise. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. What if it's a parent going with their child and they live under the same roof? Of course, if you're already living with someone under the same roof or a couple that lives together, uh, let's be clear, that's a different reality. People who live under the same roof and are already exposed to each other all day long, and this is something the governor and I uh, explicitly discussed, they already have a different reality, and they don't need to distance from each other because they're already in constant contact with each other. So if a mom goes to the playground with her child, obviously she's already in constant contact with that child. That's different than if that child came in contact with a child from another family, or that mom came in contact with a mom from a different family. That's the problem. Let's be clear. Within the family, under one roof, that's one thing. But families mixing, people connecting, who are not under the same roof, that's where we're going to see a spread of this disease that we can't have. That's where the social distancing rules come into effect, six feet apart. And we all want to be social, but we just can't the way we were. So you can go to the park, but only for a limited period of time. Families can stay together, but don't mix with other families. If you're going on your own, stay on your own. Keep six feet apart from everyone else. Go, get your exercise, get home. Uh, in terms of playgrounds, this is a thorny issue, and I'm saying this as a parent. I used to take uh, my kids to playgrounds around Prospect Park in Brooklyn constantly. I understand a lot about the culture of our playgrounds and the challenges that we deal with in normal times with all the kids who want to be on the playground. Here's what we're going to do for this next week. And I'm only saying this for this next week because we want to try it out. We're going to say to parents, look, here's the reality. If you're going to go on a playground, you have to take full responsibility for the situation. Full personal responsibility. Here are some of the realities. We cannot have overcrowding on a playground. If there are some people already on the playground, it's starting to get so you can't keep six feet away from people who are not part of your family, don't go on the playground. Uh, if our police, our parks enforcement officers, or other enforcement agents see a playground that's starting to fill up, they're going to clear it out. If you go to the playground, you need to keep your children away from children who are not part of your family. That's your responsibility. We will always do our best with city enforcement, but we can't be everywhere, obviously. You have to take responsibility. If you don't feel you can do it, don't go to the playground. Uh, some parents have said, will the playgrounds be cleaned and sanitized? The answer, just a real blunt New York City answer is no. They never have been. They can't be in this situation. It would take a Herculean effort every five minutes, literally, that we simply can't do. If your kids go to the playground, you might want them to not be on certain types of equipment or any type of equipment. You might say, I don't want to go to the playground. I just want my kids to run around in an open area. You parents have to make that decision. Well, what we're going to do is have playgrounds open to the maximum extent possible, monitored and enforced, but parents have to make their own choices for this next week as to what they feel is appropriate. I'm trying to give you real honest warnings. We'll put up signage. We'll constantly reiterate these rules, and we'll see how it goes for a week. If people are responsible about use of the playgrounds and we believe it's a good outlet for kids who are only going to get a short period of exercise each day, uh, we'll keep them open. If we feel that they're not being handled uh, properly, if we feel that uh, people are taking advantage in the wrong way of the situation or not paying attention to the rules or it's creating uh, something that's just not supportable, uh, we'll have to at that point strongly consider shutting them down. It's not something I want to do. I really don't want to do that. I'm saying that as a parent. 
So we're going to see how this week goes. And we have agreement with uh, the state of New York that that is the approach we'll take uh, tomorrow. I'm going to provide the state with a written plan delineating what I've just told you in broad stroke. And we'll work with the state each step of the way uh, going forward uh, to determine how best to handle the real sense of reality of our parks and playgrounds. But again, uh, NYPD is going to be out there. Uh, if they see anything that looks like even the beginning of a gathering, they're going to say break it up. They're going to say you got to get your quick exercise individually and get home. The message couldn't be clearer. And Commissioner Shea will give you a sense of what he's experienced in recent uh, days. But I can summarize it. New Yorkers are listening. They are following the guidance they're getting. And when a police officer or other enforcement officer tells them to do something, overwhelmingly, they are doing it. Uh, they all understand what time it is. So I think we're going to see that uh, we're going to find a way to make this work. Okay. Very quickly. Uh, let me just note. Hold on one second. Oh, this is consistent with this point. Uh, to confirm just how much New Yorkers are adhering to rules, uh, I want to give you an example. It's a very striking example for anyone who knows this town and has been here uh, for any amount of your life, especially if you've been here a long time. I think you might find this striking. Yesterday in New York City, we sent out uh, four agencies, NYPD, FDNY, Department of Buildings and Sheriff's Office, to continue doing enforcement at bars, restaurants, movie theaters, gyms, any place that we needed to ensure people were not congregating. Uh, there were 13,000 inspections yesterday by those agencies, 13,000 inspections, of which in only 11 instances was a violation given. One in a thousand, less than one in a thousand cases was it even necessary to give a violation. I think that speaks volumes about what we are dealing with now. A very important topic. There's been a lot of concern about our jail system. I'm going to be giving you constant updates. This is an area of tremendous concern, obviously. Talked about an initial group of inmates who were being reviewed for release. This will be an ongoing situation and a rapid one. Uh, I have been working closely with the police commissioner and other officials and obviously our correction leadership to determine the proper approach that is uh, humane and responsive to this crisis, but also constantly takes into effect, uh, into account, I should say, public safety and obviously uh, legal requirements. Uh, 23 uh, inmates are being released today from our jail system. Uh, those individuals are over 50 years old and low risk to reoffend. Some others, uh, we're awaiting a response from the state uh, before they can be released. We are now starting immediate work on a group of uh, 200 additional inmates who are being reviewed for release. We will have <coughs> the update on what number within those 200 will be released. That update will be tomorrow. These are primarily individuals uh, who have limited time remaining on their sentences on Rikers Island. For all those who are concerned about this issue, I'm concerned, the police commissioner is concerned, the health commissioner is concerned, the correction commissioner is concerned. We're all trying to make sense of a very uh, challenging situation in an appropriate way. We are looking at each individual <coughs> case. And some of the uh, portrayal of the situation, I think, has left out some of the complexity. Uh, there are individuals who I think are obvious uh, candidates for appropriate release. There are some other individuals with complex histories uh, that uh, raise other questions, we're going to strike that balance. But we will continually update, continually look at tranche after tranche of inmates for potential release in this crisis. This next group of 200, we will have uh, an answer on by tomorrow. Uh, there is a very rigorous uh, effort being made right now in our jail system uh, to keep everyone uh, healthy and safe uh, there's a lot of resources being applied for uh, the safety of our officers and inmates alike. That effort will continue to intensify. Uh, we have uh, updates. I know uh, some of them, I believe, have been announced about changes in testing uh, locations. Uh, you can hear later on details from the health commissioner and from our uh, health and hospitals CEO. Uh, there's been a closure of the site at Jacoby. Uh, we'll explain that uh, when we get to Q&A. 
Uh, everything is being done specifically related to prioritization. That means ensuring that we get to those individual patients in greatest need, and we do everything we can to use our testing capacity, ease the burden on emergency rooms. Testing has been fully focused on priority needs, uh, structural needs to keep our health system going to reach those in greatest danger. It will be tightly organized uh, according to that principle, and we can get into detail in the Q&A. Few other points quickly. Uh, for our healthcare workers, these are the people, there's so many heroes in this city, and there's so many people are depending on, I think we can all agree there is no group of New Yorkers we are depending on more right now than our doctors, our nurses, our lab techs, every human being who works in our healthcare system is precious right now. Uh, these folks are doing heroic work. They're working exceedingly long hours. They are putting themselves at risk. We must support them in every way we can. A small but helpful thing we can do right now, in light of the profound changes in this city, the fact that so much of the city is not operating the way it normally does, and, and the idea of commuting has been fundamentally changed, and so many parts of our city are not seeing the kind of traffic, et cetera, that we're used to, uh, we're going to do something temporarily in this crisis uh, and grant parking permits to uh, healthcare workers who we need uh, to serve this city in this crisis. So there'll be a process to determine who qualifies, and we will begin with 10,000 uh, permits for these heroic workers uh, that we will start to distribute as early as tomorrow. Uh, related to uh, how people get around, there's an excellent question in the last day or two on uh, what is essential in terms of how people uh, deal with this crisis. And the question that was asked to me is if car repair, uh, mechanic shops, automotive shops are being kept open, shouldn't bike repair shops be kept open? I thought it was a very good question. Uh, we in the city have compared notes with the state, and we have agreement that, yes, bike repair shops are essential at this time of crisis because more and more people depend on their bicycles. So, yes, we will instruct uh, that bike repair shops will be treated as essential, uh, and if they are open, uh, all of our enforcement agents will know uh, to respect that and allow them to keep doing their work that we all need. Finally, uh, before I give you a few words in Spanish, um, just to say, I don't think anyone will be surprised to know that since we're in a crisis, we really have to be careful uh, for everything we need, everything that's a basic need, and no, uh, nothing is more basic when it comes to protecting people's health care than ensuring that there is a blood supply to serve all New Yorkers. Uh, right now, our blood supply is sufficient, but a lot of the blood drives that happen throughout the year, particularly based in companies, uh, that we appreciate deeply. A lot of those have been canceled because the companies have had to shut down. Uh, giving blood is essential. So we need New Yorkers to step forward, uh, go to any uh, New York blood center site in the city. If you are going to give blood, uh, everyone will know that that is an essential activity. Again, you go, you uh, participate, every one of us says thank you, and then get back home as with everything else. Uh, if you are ready and willing and able to give blood, please call 800-933-2566. Again, 800-933-2566, or go to www.nybc.org, nybc.org. Uh, everyone, I've, I've heard from so many New Yorkers who want to do something, who are looking to be helpful and you know, are frustrated by this crisis and want to help. Here is a way that anyone who qualifies can help. So we really, really appreciate that. In Spanish, Comenzando esta noche, solo los negocios esenciales estarán abiertos en la ciudad de Nueva York. Les insistimos a todos, quédense en casa a menos que tenga que salir por razón esencial y protejan a los más vulnerables. Los meses que vienen van a ser difíciles, pero vamos a superar esta crisis como siempre lo hacen los neoyorquinos. With that, I want to turn to our police commissioner,
I want to thank you, Commissioner, and all the men and women of the NYPD who are absolutely outstanding work in this crisis. And I know uh, together we're going to be figuring out how to do some new things. Uh, but I know you are up to the task, as are the men and women who serve under your command. Commissioner Dermot Shea. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As the mayor said, it's been an interesting couple weeks here, but I can tell you definitively that the, the men and women of the New York City Police Department, uh, as well as all the other city agencies, certainly the health care workers um, across the board, are rising to the challenge. And, and it's at a time like this when, quite frankly, you see the best in people come out. And we're seeing it day in and day out. The traditional... Uh, crime that we put on the shoulders of the men and women of the New York City Police Department has not been forgotten, but there is so much more that they've picked up in the last couple of weeks. Just uh, most recently in the last couple of days, we've begun surveying over 500 large supermarkets in New York City. Um, just yesterday in the last 24 hours, um, between pharmacies and supermarkets, over 1,600 visits mm. by the men and women of the New York City Police Department, and literally no issues. Um, a, couple, a couple discussions about overcrowding, but overall very well. In the last 24 hours, over 5,500 bars and restaurants, and that's the story that you're continuing to see, cooperation by New Yorkers. <clears throat> um, two arrests in, out of 5,500, and that I believe is one incident in Queens. So by and large, we are seeing cooperation. We're seeing New Yorkers rise to the challenge throughout the city Amen. in all five boroughs. You're seeing tasks picked up by the men and women of the police department. Um, in reaching out to elderly people that may not be serviced by traditional means and working with elected officials, working with community partners, getting them food. So I can, I can tell you that I, I couldn't be more proud of what I've seen. Um, to the parks, the mayor mentioned the parks. And in the last uh, couple days, it's an, interest, it's an interesting dynamic now as we get through this time where we've been all stressed, I think, and all pent up inside. And we are like no other city in the world. Um, in a city of over 8 million people, a vertical city. And you, you saw yesterday um, people getting out, exercising, which is a good thing. I can tell you that I, I hit the, in the last 48 hours, the East River Park, the West Side Highway. I personally saw Riverside Park, Central Park. Over 99% of what I saw is what you hope to see. New Yorkers coming out, parents with kids, responsibly getting the exercise that the, the mayor talked about. Um, no, I did not see organized sports. The biggest thing I saw was a two-on-two -two pickup game. And I can tell you that the men and women now of the New York City Police Department are getting more and more involved in this, as the mayor said. I made calls yesterday with some of the borough and, and bureau commanders of the NYPD to just reinforce that messaging piece of this. We're all in this together. Reinforce that positive message. As much as you want to get out, there's a responsible way to do it. And, and that's what we all need to hear and, and take part in. So you'll, you'll expect to see um, police officers throughout the five boroughs, whether it's on a bicycle, probably on some scooters and some uh, marked police cars, driving slowly through the parks and just broadcasting and speaking to people about that message. Enjoy how you're doing, get your exercise, and then to politely Get out of here. And, and I say that tongue in cheek. Um, we are all in this together. And, and it was really, it was heartwarming, I'm sure, to see, um, Mr. May, you touched on it. People that, are, people that are behind closed doors all day, every day, um, that's not really what we're worried about when they're walking. A husband and wife holding hands in the park, taking a walk with their dog, that's not really what we're worried about. They're together in the apartment anyway, but it's the large groups. I heard from some elected officials yesterday and throughout the city working on this. Um, we got we to gotta think, think long distance here. This is a long game. So those backyard parties, those DJs, I'm sorry, DJs. I know how everyone is hurting here, but we can't be having parties with large gatherings, uh, whether it's in backyards or anywhere else in New York City at this time right now. It's just too dangerous. So thank you. I'm sure we'll have some questions. But again, um, on behalf of all the men and women of the police department, thank you for all the kind words. We are there for you, and we're going to continue to be there for you. Thank you very, very much, Commissioner. I think you laid it out very, very clearly. Uh, I think you said a very nice version of get out of here. I, I like that. And it will, we'll, uh, we'll make sure the message spreads in a, in a very smart, fair, decent way. Uh, with that, um, want to make sure uh, that we now have an opportunity to take questions from the media on all the things we talk about here and any other topics they would like to bring up. 
And let's turn to the media questions. Who's first? Hi, all. Just a quick note at the top. We ask that everyone limit their questions to no more than two, including follow-ups. This allows us to be fair and try to get to as many people as possible. Uh, we will start off today with Aaron from The Post. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Oh, so just wanted to uh, circle back on the uh, issue of parks and people going outdoors to uh, get their exercise. Uh, I just want to see if there's any sort of understanding as far as what the cutoff would be, how much time is enough time, uh, and also uh, understanding that people have been pretty good about abiding by these rules as far as businesses goes, what the sort of potential enforcement or penalties might look like if you encountered anyone uh, particularly obstinate. I'll start, and I'm sure the commissioner has a view too. Um, first thing I want to say is the NYPD... Every single day, and I would say this about parks enforcement, and you know, depending on how this plays out, we could easily get other agencies involved as well. But the story that I think is missed, and I don't, I don't ever blame the media for telling the exceptional story or the dramatic story, but I would like us all to do a little bit more, particularly in time of crisis, to acknowledge what is exceptional and dramatic and unusual versus what is typical. When you hear the number of inspections were made and you only had 11 violations, as I mentioned earlier, out of 13,000 inspections, that, that really says something not just about store owners, but about what people in general are understanding about this crisis. And I have seen it in many places I've been in recent days. I, I really think there's a deep understanding that something profound has changed and it has to be handled differently. And I have a lot of faith in New Yorkers. I have a lot of faith in everyday people. Will there be some individuals out of 8.6 million people who don't get it? Of course. And our officers, for time immemorial, have had to deal with people who don't get it, people who try and make their own rules, people who think they're smarter than anyone else. I assure you, there's no one more worldly wise than a New York City police officer. There's no one understands the human condition better than a New York City police officer. And they are extraordinarily resourceful, our officers. So sometimes... Uh, they use humor, sometimes they use firmness, uh, sometimes they illustrate their point, whatever it is, I've seen it throughout my life. They know how to talk to people, they know how to talk to young people and old people, they know how to talk to every kind of person. They'll make clear what you gotta do, and I believe the vast, vast majority of New Yorkers will listen. We're not to the point yet of specific sanctions because we're starting down a road and we'll decide with the state if we need to get into uh, sanctions more deeply, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think the number of people who truly don't get it and try and stand apart is gonna be limited. And I affirm, if someone really wants to disagree with a police officer and acts in a manner that's inappropriate and illegal, well then they will be handled the same way as anyone else who obstructs the work of a police officer. But I don't think we're even talking about the level we might see of that in normal times because we're dealing with a crisis that's being felt in every inch of our city. Uh, I, th I predict you're going to see a different reality in the world will spread. And I'll turn to the commissioner one more point. How much time? Well, you know, we're going to work on this, and I think it would be helpful to give people some guidance. But I, I just want to start with common sense. How much time does it take to exercise? Folks who go for a jog in the morning know how long they go for a jog. People go for a bike ride know how long their bike ride is. People go for a walk know how long their walk is. You know what? If you're exercising now and you have a basic thing you do, for a lot of people I'd say it's a half hour, you know, 45 minutes, something like that, go get in your exercise and get home. Or go do your exercise, go to the store, get home. The point is maximize the get home part. Get only the most basic exercise. Understand you need to walk your dog, walk your dog, and then get home. Your kids, understand you have young kids that are going crazy inside. You need to get them outside for a while. Get them outside for a while. As soon as you get them through a little bit of you know, working off their steam, get them back home. So we'll give some guidelines, but this is also about personal responsibility. This is about common sense, which is what the vast majority of New Yorkers have. We're not going to allow gatherings. We're not going to allow loitering. We're not going to allow someone just to hang out and, you know, for a long period of time. If an officer sees you and you're sitting on a park bench, they're going to say, hey, 
uh, you know, you need to get home. Uh, the person says, oh, you know, I'm only going to be here for a few minutes and I'm going home. Fine. If someone thinks they can hang around for a long period of time, I assure you that officer will remind them again uh, energetically. But people just have to get it. We have to help ourselves and each other uh, by taking seriously, you know, just what you need, nothing more, and get home. Commissioner. I, I, as I hear this discussion, I, I'm thinking, and I laugh at the reputation that we have as New Yorkers of running around, running from one location to the other, bumping past each other, probably like no other city. Um, I've seen the opposite in the last two weeks, and I'm sure you have too, whether it's in parks or walking around. There's a forced politeness these days of allowing one to pass before you proceed down a path. That's what I saw in the parks yesterday, uh, and not universally, but you saw people giving each other that wide berth. In two weeks, we've learned to distance, whether it may not always be six feet, it may be three to four feet, but you're seeing this all over. And I saw it yesterday in every park that I visited. Um, not universally, um, some issues. We will, we will double down on the education piece. And this, this, I'll tell you, on a personal level, this hurts. The last thing you want to do is tell kids that are doing everything we want them to ordinarily, but not under these extreme circumstances, get out of a park. But we have to, we will, we'll continue to educate. And, and again, I think the message here is you can find... Um, three or 10 or whatever it is, messages on Twitter. I was out there myself and saw it firsthand. By and large, um, there were no or large organized sports. There was people getting out on a beautiful day in a really difficult situation. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor it. We'll, we'll step up the, the presence as well as the audio messages and the speaking. And, and again, this is, this is probably the least of my concerns. I wanna just build Please, on Commissioner. that. I just want to build on that to say, as the mayor mentioned, we want New Yorkers to use good judgment in terms of time, but I want them to pay a special attention to ensuring distance. This is about distance. This is not so much about time as it is about distance. And the longer, given the density of our city, the longer someone stays outside, the greater the risk of coming in contact with someone within that six feet perimeter. And so that's why focus on distance, not so much on time. Right, I wanna just, that's great. And I wanna just put a point on that and then we'll keep going. I, I think Commissioner Barbeau said something that's really good common sense guidance. Yeah, if you stay out longer, your chances of bumping into someone, your chances of, uh, being put in a situation that's not the ideal, which is six feet apart, uh, those chances increase. Where do you know you're not going to bump into someone or end up uh, coming in contact with someone else who, God forbid, may have the disease? At home, right? It's when you're at home, you know what you're dealing with. So you get the exercise you need, keep it as tight as you can in terms of time. Uh, you go to the store. Even if you go to the store, Keep your time as tight as possible. Observe that six-foot distancing. Soon as you're done, get back home because that's the safe thing to do. And it's not, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. But it's also not going to be forever. And we want to keep people safe. Go ahead. If I could just uh, one more in that vein, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Governor Cuomo this morning floated the ideas of potentially uh, – opening up some streets, uh, or I should say closing them to vehicular traffic and opening them up for uh, people who want to get out, stretch their legs, get a little fresh air. Is that uh, anything that's being considered? And uh, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I spoke to the governor about this, and uh, we had a great conversation, and we're going to, again, we're going to codify in the next 24 hours our approach here in New York City, uh, share it with the state, with the governor's team, and we'll take it from there. But we had a high level of agreement in the conversation earlier today. Um, we're certainly going to consider over time uh, the possibility of opening up uh, some streets for recreation. But I want to caution the first frame is the first frame here, which is we want people to get that exercise, get that time they need. But we also need to enforce it. And our ability to enforce directly correlates to knowing where we need to put our focus, our energy, uh, and our officers. We know where that is right now in terms of our parks and playgrounds because right now the NYPD patrols those areas, the parks enforcement uh, patrols those areas. 
that is something that we can focus on, have a strategy for, and do the right way. If we're going to expand, we're going to expand very purposefully. If we're going to look to have a street uh, that's uh, opened up for recreation, we're going to do that very smartly and carefully because we have to attach enforcement to it. It cannot be, oh, we're just going to close off some streets and leave it be. If we do that, I guarantee you what will happen is a whole lot of people start to congregate. And again, because we're, we're, we're humans, we're social, we're, you know, it's natural, and people won't remember, and they'll, they'll fall into I see it all the time in the last few days. People start to reach out their hand to shake hands or start to want to hug someone they know, and they stop themselves, almost without ex exception. I find that sort of sudden stop. It's going to take us a long time to get used to it. So if your block, you know, if you, if you put barriers at the end of your block, everyone's going to come out and hang out like it's normal. We can't have that. Uh, we got to do this in a systematic, careful fashion. So that's an idea that's on the table. What I would say is think of it this way. We're going to start with the parks and playgrounds we have that we know how to patrol, determine over the coming days if we need to expand that, and if so, how. But most importantly, how do we enforce it? How do we keep eyes on it? How do we make sure it works? So one stage at a time, and we will keep people updated as we do. Go ahead. Thank you. Next, we have Alex from the Daily Beast. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, there's growing concern among a lot of gig economy workers, not uh, delivery people, but freelancers in general. We've now passed a cycle of a single paycheck, and some people are out of money. Uh, if someone is entirely out of money, let's say, and that goes everywhere from rent to food, what actions should they be taking? It's a very painful situation. I'm glad you raised it, Alex, because this is, I think the gig workers are facing some of the toughest dynamics here. Um, obviously, it depends on each individual. Uh, anyone who, again, I'm, I, everyone's different. Everyone's a different situation. Anyone who does have the opportunity to apply for unemployment insurance obviously should. Uh, but we also know that system's overloaded. I'm not belittling that fact. Uh, we are hoping and praying uh, that the Congress acts very quickly on a stimulus that is direct money into the pockets of working people, including gig economy workers. Uh, obviously, there have been some other actions taken, which I'm happy about, including by the federal government, like uh, limiting uh, student loan repayments and actions that have been taken uh, by the city and state uh, to ward off evictions. Uh, all of those things help, uh, but we're going to have to do a lot more. Uh, and again, the place where we need help the most is the federal government because the city is, you know, really struggling right now uh, to cover needs with what we have and with our own resources and our revenue that's clearly declining rapidly. So uh, I think it is that stimulus bill. And then it's the things we're going to try and do that, God forbid, there's a gig worker who, as you said, hasn't gotten that paycheck, is starting to struggle to find food. That's exactly why Catherine Garcia has been named to this new position, to create a food network, uh, you know, a food distribution network, uh, to help people who, honestly, maybe a few weeks ago, never in a million years would have thought of needing food uh, and government support like that, but now they will. Uh, so at least with no evictions at this moment, uh, hopefully people can pay the rent on time, but if they can't, uh, they won't be evicted right now, and we're looking to find other ways to provide support and relief uh, to ensure that people don't have money or are not forced to pay rent that uh, they just can't afford. Uh, hopefully we can ensure there's a steady supply of food, uh, and that will at least get us uh, a fair amount along the way. And I remind people in terms of health care, there's going to be people who won't be able to afford medicine. We're going to try and work on that issue too, but anyone who really is uh, dealing with a, a serious, serious health care issue Thank God for our public hospitals and clinics that will always back people up, uh, regardless of ability to pay. Thank you. Uh, and one more question. Uh, it's being reported right now that two dorms of 45 people incarcerated at Rikers are refusing to leave their dorms for work duties and meals in protest. And I'm just curious, is there a way that you guys could be possibly like speeding up um, that the release uh, and relief of certain prisoners uh, in our jail system. Yeah, we are absolutely going to move very fast now. We had to work through some legal issues that were complex issues, as I said, involving DAs and the state. 
Uh, we have a clearer template. We were working on this literally past midnight. I was here in City Hall uh, after midnight, still on conference calls with people working this through because this stuff is very complex. Um, but uh, I am confident now that we have the ability to figure out what that right number is. I don't know the number yet. I want to be real with you and honest with you. And there are some people who clearly we are not going to feel comfortable releasing. Um, but we will steadily increase the number to the point that we believe is appropriate. I cannot confirm the report that you just gave. I've heard that, but I have not heard it in a confirmed manner. So we will uh, get that information clarified. But suffice it to say, over the next few days, uh, those who can be released to the maximum extent possible, we're going to try and do that over the next few days. Go ahead. Next up, we've got Amanda from Politico. Go ahead, Amanda. Amanda? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I have a question for you and Dr. Katz. I was hoping you could circle back to the Jacoby. Yes, Dr. Katz, Dr. Katz is not in the room, but through the miracle of technology, I think he can hear us. Dr. Katz, can you hear us? Dr. Katz. Paging Dr. Katz. He's on. Is there a Dr. Katz? He's on? He just can't, he can't respond to me. Is that right? But he's talking on the line. Okay. Amanda, we'll come back to you. We'll be right back around. Appreciate okay. It. Thank you. Who's next? We have Ashley from the New York Times. Go ahead, Ashley. Ashley. Good there you go. Yeah, I'm here. Um, the question I want to ask is for the police commissioner about exposure since uh, officers are basically intensifying their role in um, the corona in kind of making sure that everybody uh, adheres to the rules. I'm wondering if you can give us raw numbers on people who are infected and out sick due to coronavirus inside the department and um, tell us how, it, if and how, the NYPD tracks exposure. So, yeah, Ashley, I, at the beginning, I had a little trouble hearing you, but I think I got the whole thing. The most current numbers that I have, and, and they are moving, is 98 members of the NYPD have tested positive for corona. Of the 98, 70 are on the uniform side, 28 are from uh, the civilian side. It's important to know that um, in terms of how they contracted it, you know, the belief at this time with very limited information, obviously, is that it's not necessarily contracted at work, that some are contracted sick family members. We are. New York. So uh, as society uh, contracts this disease and, um, you know, so do we. In terms of the testing, the numbers are going up um, because the testing on uh, the entire city is going up. So that's not unexpected. In terms of sick rate, I'll stay away from exact numbers, but I can tell you that our normal, if you, if you have a normal sick rate, and we do, um, for the department, it's, it's approaching about double that rate. And we saw the numbers start to go up uh, when this really took hold, roughly March 17th. I could tell you that we are still, what I would consider, in very good shape in terms of resources. Um, but we plan for it literally every day. If I, if I told you how many phone conferences I had in the last 24 hours, I'd be lying because I literally... Terry Monahan is sick of hearing from me. Rodney Harrison, the entire executive Let's staff. Let's be clear. Terry Monahan is not sick. He's just sick of hearing. Yes, from that's correct. <laughs> so we are um, we are not at the point where we're, we're close to going to 12-hour tours. What we are doing, though, is planning for all eventualities and moving people um, from units that uh, are less important right now to, you know, be ready for any and uh, all eventuality. So I think that we are in a good place still, and the planning is literally ongoing hour by hour. The other thing I just, uh, before Ashley follows on, I just want to say is, again, as we've heard from Dr. Barbeau, uh, a typical uh, younger, and this is, again, most PD officers, younger person, healthy. 20s, 30s, 40s, a healthy person, 
Uh, their experience with this disease will be something like seven to 10 days, and it will not be a fun seven to 10 days, but at the end of that seven to 10 days, they will be right back in uniform, right back at their post. So this is a number that goes up, and but will have an element that starts to go right back down from that original group that got sick. A lot of them will come back online. We'll be going through this for weeks and months. I don't want any misimpression uh, that a person who contracts coronavirus is you know, not coming back to work. <laughs> they are coming back to work in the vast majority of cases and soon. Uh, and we got to keep that in our calculations and in our planning. And obviously, we're very happy that most people are going to have a mild experience. Yeah, I, I could tell you, Ashley, and if I miss one point, I'll circle back to you at the end. Um, I could tell you that we've had people come back to work that had been put on quarantine. And I am really looking forward to uh, when those people that are out sick with this virus come back to work for, for the obvious reasons. But I think, again, we're in good shape of the now 98. I, I think there's three that remain hospitalized. Um, and that's including one that was discharged today. So that brings it to three. And that's um, with pneumonia-like symptoms. I think I mentioned that the other day. Uh, so the vast, vast majority, 95 of 98, are recovering at home. But for those officers who've had contacts with the public, is the NYPD tracking that? And are you telling members of the public that they've had contact with an officer who has now been confirmed to have uh, COVID? You're talking post the, the, yeah, post, post come, once the officer tests positive, are you going back and telling members of the public who they've interacted with in the course of doing their job yep. that, that, that they have interacted with them? Yeah, Do you well, have numbers on that? Well, no, I don't. And we'll take a look at that with legal. Obviously, you run into some HIPAA issues I, I and things beyond, of that nature. I go beyond it, and I'll pass the commissioner. Yeah. I, I think we are at such an advanced stage in this crisis, uh, but for a very particular situation Everyone. where we thought, uh, where our health people thought it was important to do that follow through. I, I think the honest truth, Ashley, is we're in a new reality here uh, where that generally is not going to be doable, nor is it necessarily going to make much sense. And I think the commissioner is going to follow this on because of the sheer spread that we're experiencing overall. Right. As I've been saying for the past couple of days, which feels like the past couple of weeks, sure um, we do have widespread community transmission. So that means that uh, it's very likely that a large number of people are already exposed and there is no real way to track down back to the point source. The other thing I want to just emphasize is that even though we are learning more and more about how this virus has transmitted. We still don't think that just casual contact passing someone in the street is gonna infect folks, right? We're asking people to remain six feet apart because that's the general distance that a good, healthy, strong cough or sneeze has to get from one person to the other. And so I just wanna remind us of the basics and it's not just passing someone uh, in the street, it's not even limited contact, it goes back to those basics. And so um, while the tendency may be to wanna let everybody know uh, who it is that may they may have contact with that may have had contact with yet another contact, it, you know, it, it that kind of becomes irrelevant when we've got widespread community transmission. And that's why I have been so, dare I say, militant about having New Yorkers stay indoors. Amen. Okay, who's up? Dr. Katz's issues have been resolved. Dr. Katz, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry. I could hear you always, but I had a technical problem. All right. The, One, thanks so much for yeah. the question. Uh, with Jacoby, we switched. Wait, is Amanda, to hold on. Is Amanda back on the line? I'm sorry, Dr. Katz. Is Amanda back? Yes. Okay. Yes? Amanda, we, had, uh, we changed the method of testing uh, from more of a walk-by or drive-by model to at Jacoby. It will reopen tomorrow to relieve the emergency department, which is consistent with what the mayor says, that we need to focus our testing on those people who are most sick and help to decompress the emergency rooms where people are coming with mild symptoms. We need to focus our attention on those people who are sickest. Dr. 
Mr. Katz, I'm, I'm hoping you're feeling okay and getting some sleep. Um, or is this transition going to happen across all health and hospitals facilities, or are we starting at Jacoby? Um, well, well, thank you, Amanda. All of our hospitals will have a tent outside as a way to decompress our emergency rooms. Several of them already have it. I visited the tent that, that was at Elmhurst and the tent that was already at Lincoln. Uh, Jacoby had the other model, and that's changing to the tent outside of the emergency room for this week coming. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have Craig from the Post. How are you today? Um, I'm, the unions have been calling for uh, additional testing for uh, a fire, EMS, and NYPD. I was wondering, since these are the guys on the front line, they're you know, going in there, getting people out of parks. Is there going to be any plan to maybe do uh, expedited testing for them if they're concerned that they have coronavirus since we're, they're out in the streets? I'll start and my colleagues will join in again. The entire testing system is based on the priority needs. There's a priority given, of course, to protecting our healthcare workers and our first responders. But that's done still according to the health care priorities overall. If someone is young and healthy uh, and has symptoms, uh, there's many, many cases where they're just going to ride it out and they're going to be well and they're going to come back. If after those three or four days uh, we're not seeing them get better, that's a different discussion. But it's about uh, a priority structure that we have to remember that the Testing has to be there to protect the people in greatest danger. You want to speak to that, Commissioner? Certainly. I think to the extent that they fall into the prioritization categories of being over 50, having one of the chronic underlying illnesses, being sick, not getting better, and having their doctor determine that knowing the test status is going to change the course of therapy, then of course we would want to test them. But the basic message of if you're sick, stay home, stay home for at least seven days since your symptom onset or three days after your fever has gone away, whichever is longer, will continue to apply. Okay. Who's next? Next we have Katie. Who's Hi, can that? you hear I'm me? Sorry. Who is it? Mayor, can you hear me, Mayor? Yep. Go ahead, Katie. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm calling to ask if the city's discussed if there might be any changes to property taxes, which are due in April. Uh, at this point, and we'll obviously be looking at everything, Katie, but uh, we are in a really tough situation right now in this city, and I need to be very plain with New Yorkers about this. Um, in the Congress as we speak, there is a real discussion going on. This is directly responsive to your question. There's a real discussion going on about relief for states, counties, and cities, direct relief to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. Because right now, all local governments are just hemorrhaging money and dealing with massive new challenges and plummeting revenue. An example, I believe this estimate is right from our uh, OMB. When the president canceled or postponed, I should say, uh, income tax payments, that immediately took about $1.7 billion of revenue away from New York City at the height of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, that's a massive amount of money to have taken out of our hands just when we need it the most. So revenue is being stressed very, very deeply. Expenses are skyrocketing. We have a lot of tough choices ahead. I'll certainly consider all options, but it is not my instinct uh, to take away other forms of revenue because we literally will not be able to pay for basic services. Uh, now, if we get a massive direct federal stimulus, and I know Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand have been fighting for that very hard. I spoke to both of them yesterday. If we get that support, if it's really showing up quickly, that will affect our thinking. That will affect the equation. But I've heard in the course of today that, unfortunately, Republicans in the Senate are trying to remove any form of direct support for cities, states, and counties, which makes no sense in the middle of the biggest national crisis since the Great Depression. And that's going to hurt red states and blue states alike. It makes no sense. 
Uh, we need that support. We need the uh, hundreds of billions for localities and for hospitals, also hundreds of billions, to be able to keep everything going. We have no guarantees of if and when and how that's going to happen. So the answer to your question is, certainly I'm not ready to say that today. I don't think that's something we're going to want to do, but we're going to look at everything. Next up, we have Gersh. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can. I, I promise you no unauthorized dinging today. I've turned off my notifications. Ah, excellent. So you mentioned 10,000 new placards for health care workers. And as you know, most New Yorkers will completely agree on the need to help essential health care workers do their jobs. But doesn't this emergency order actually reveal how completely unnecessary the vast majority of the city's other 150,000 placards are? Because those are, after all, in most cases, just a job perk. Uh, Gersh, uh, it's a fair question, but it's honestly not a question for today. We uh, I've, we've talked plenty of times about the need to change the approach to placards. Uh, I believe that it not only needs to be fundamentally changed, it will be as we bring on automated enforcement systems. Uh, and we're going to be very quick to take placards away from those who abuse. And I think we're going to have the greatest ability to know that in the next year or so that we've ever had in the history of the city. But right now, uh, that's a bluntly a secondary issue. This is about uh, making sure that people who are desperately needed uh, can get where they need to go. They're working very long hours. This is an emergency measure that we need to do. We'll deal with the rest of that when we get back to normalcy. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Next, we have Jeff Mays. Everyone's well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask, uh, the governor painted a very different picture of what he saw yesterday. In New York City, when he uh, drove around, he, he was very frustrated and talked about how there were a lot of people out, a lot of people in the parks. But that's very different than the picture that yourself and the commissioner uh, painted just now. What's the difference there? Why is the governor seeing one thing, but you guys are seeing something different? Well, look, um, first of all, people can be at different places at different times, Jeff, and see different things. I think there's a tremendous consistency in the sense that we all are looking for where we think there's a problem or lack of adherence. Uh, when we see it, we don't like it, we're going to deal with it. And we all agree that's not most people. In fact, I think the governor's uh, frustration was directed at the few who were being uh, disrespectful of others, not at the vast majority who are following the rules. But again, I spoke to the governor uh, today in detail. Uh, and I'm confident that in that conversation, we uh, aligned fully. Uh, we're going to have a strong enforcement apparatus from the finest law enforcement organization in the world. And I am certain it's going to be very, very effective. And, you know, I think there's going to be a certain amount of pressure from fellow New Yorkers, too. I think the point that you heard from my colleagues about people like literally, I think you said cutting people a wide berth. And we were talking about the ways people are adjusting and changing. I'm seeing it 100 percent. Uh, folks used to just walk by each other. They're now like stopping, figuring out who goes first. You know, is there enough room to have your six feet? That's only going to deepen. We're about to really feel the change in our lives with this new rule in effect. And so many people home, I think it's going to really jolt people's consciousness. And this is the beginning of the crisis. I've been blunt. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. So Governor and I are aligned. And we're going to say to anyone who's not getting the message, we're going to help them get the message. And then, obviously, I believe people will uh, start to fall in line even more deeply. Just another follow-up. Um, do you know what's happening uh, to the prisoners that are being released? Are they being monitored? Where are they going? Yeah. Um, and then, quickly, have you still been in contact with federal officials? You mentioned earlier this week... You have spoken to Dr. Fauci and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Chairman. Um, have you had further conversations with federal officials? Yeah, I just want, uh, I'll answer, Jeff, but I want to, again, in the name of rationing as we do these calls, uh, we're, I think we're saying to people, try and keep it to uh, two areas, and, and please try not to do multiple run-on many, many topics at once, because I think we want to make sure it's fair to everyone else. Um, uh, I spoke to the uh, Veterans Affairs Secretary uh, yesterday. I am trying to reach v Vice President Pence. 
I am trying to reach the FEMA director. I know my team has spoken to the FEMA director. This will be ongoing. I've spoken to Senator Schumer almost every day. He spoke to Senator Gillibrand yesterday. This will be ongoing. Um, I've spoken to Dr. Fauci a number of times. Uh, again, uh, uh, what I'm looking for is the big answers on what will be delivered to us. On the question of uh, folks who are released from our jail system, there will be monitoring for sure. There will be individualized monitoring and follow-up and supervision. Who's next? Next up is Marina from AP. Marina? Hello. I was wondering about the um, what the conditions are at the local city hospitals. Um, we're seeing some videos on social media of patients in masks lying on the floor because there are no beds. Is that real? Mitch, are you on the line still? Dr. Mitch Katz? I am on the line, sir. M masks lying on the beds? I don't understand that. We're seeing, sorry, we're seeing a video of... Um, of patients on we're seeing videos on social media of patients who are wearing masks lying on the floor because there are no beds is that real is that fake um you mean the you patients that i'm sorry marina just to clarify you're saying patients who instead of being in a bed or a stretcher are on the floor yes I, okay I, I have not heard that previously mitch what have you heard no uh it it is not true uh, there are no sick patients lying on the floor at any of our hospitals. And if, if you have details, Marina, we want them. If there's any place where something's not being done right, we want to know about it. Uh, there's definitely some real stress now on our public hospitals. I've been very blunt about the fact that the next 10 days are going to get harder and harder, and we desperately need resupply. But we welcome from our colleagues in the media, if you have a specific situation, which might mean Honestly, there's something wrong at a particular place, a particular moment that needs to be addressed by management. Uh, please get us those specifics, even if you want to do it confidentially, so we can follow up and help people. And are you aware of any nursing homes or um, who are experiencing any sort of uh, an, a, a high number of cases like the uh, retirement community on Long Island? Are there any plans to test? everyone who's working or a resident of a nursing home? I'll turn to Dr. Barbeau. I mean, the, the, the primary uh, regulation of nursing homes is by the state. And obviously, there's a lot of division of labor going on right now with so much to do. Uh, but Dr. Barbeau does try and stay in regular touch with the state health commissioner, Dr. Zucker. Uh, on this question, are you hearing about any particular areas of concern with the city nursing homes? So we, we are in close coordination with the state. <clears throat> excuse me, close coordination with the state on nursing homes. And prior to the start of this, uh, the upscale in this outbreak, we had actually sent out uh, a number of surgical masks to the nursing homes in anticipation of uh, increasing cases. And to my knowledge, there aren't any ongoing outbreaks. But again, um, things are moving very quickly they're always in flux, and my staff and the state staff are working closely to ensure that we are especially vigilant with nursing homes, long-term care facilities. Uh, the governor has restricted uh, access to those facilities, again, trying to minimize the number of individuals who may show up to them uh, who are symptomatic. Next, we have Mark Morales from CNN. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good, good. So I had a couple of questions. The first was uh, in regards to the uh, the testing centers in Manhattan. Uh, why were they canceled, and, and what's the status of, uh, of what FEMA's doing? So let's see. that I want to make sure we're getting the right person on this one. We're not talking about health and hospitals. You're talking about the work that we're now going to be doing with FEMA for testing. Is that right? Right, right, and the, and the location that was going to be there in Manhattan. Right, so I think that Deanne Criswell, I believe, is on the line, our uh, emergency management commissioner. Deanne, do you want to speak to, and Deanne, I want to remind everyone, uh, served, you know, she's done many things in her life, firefighter, Air Force officer, but also served at FEMA. So uh, she's quite familiar with how to coordinate with them. Deanne, can you speak to 
uh, that situation? Yes, I absolutely can. Uh, so FEMA did provide some testing equipment and personal protective equipment, and we were originally going to set up five separate drive through sites. Um, right now, in an effort to utilize the limited resources that we have while still expanding the city's overall testing capacity, we are going to be co-locating these testing sites now with our health and hospitals locations so we can maximize their use in those locations while making the best use of some of the personal protective equipment that is in really limited supply. Yeah, and Mark, I want to emphasize we're, you know, it's so painful to think of the greatest city in the world with the greatest uh, health care organizations, the greatest professionals on earth. I mean, we, we are so blessed. But if you don't have equipment and you don't have supplies, it's a whole different ballgame. And we all know that um, when we really needed the testing, when it could have been uh, absolutely strategically crucial, we didn't have it. And now we're at a point where we have to treat testing on a priority basis, given this massive community spread. But even that has to now be uh, thought about in terms of the uh, supplies and the equipment needed even just to keep the testing going as much as we want, because the first obligation is to save human lives. And when we're having to wonder, are there going to be enough masks, for example, for medical personnel, first responders, for everyone who's at the front line saving lives, it gets more and more complex by the day, the considerations that all of our healthcare and emergency management professionals are making uh, with you know, no guarantees of resupply and uh, supplies dwindling constantly. I said originally, you know, I thought the thing we needed to worry about was the first or second week of April. I unfortunately can't say that anymore. Right now, uh, even getting through the month of March is getting harder. Uh, certainly, we expect tremendous difficulties in the first week of April if we don't get resupplied. Uh, so I everything is changing by the day in our calculations. And, you know, it all comes down to uh, if we don't start to change that supply situation, if we don't get the help we deserve, uh, we're going to have to make even more challenging decisions. The other question I had was in regards to uh, to Rikers. Uh, it's about those two dormitories, about the inmates who are inside, who are not going outside of their dormitories, they're, and I think they're, they're refusing meals. What's being done about that? What are the conditions there? And can you give more specifics as to the monitoring process of inmates when they're going to be released? We'll get you more on the monitoring. We are obviously creating this approach as we go along, but it's based on some of the other work that we do with supervised release. So we'll get you details on that. Uh, in terms of the situation on Rikers, we again don't have confirmation of the specifics, so don't want to comment until we do have confirmation. Uh, our job is to protect everyone. There's a lot of extraordinary professionals who pro not provide correctional health on Rikers and other facilities. Obviously our corrections officers who protect everyone. Um, and we, look, the, the one positive X factor here is compi compared to six years ago, we literally have half the population in our jail system we had six years ago. We, we used to be around 11,000 plus, and now we're uh, between 5,000 and 5,500. And we do think we'll be in a position very soon uh, to start acting on hundreds of releases. Uh, but this is being created uh, very, very urgently and also in a way we've never had to do before. And so there's a lot being worked through. We'll have more to say on all of that, you know, in the coming hours as we have more detail. Next, we have Rosa. Who is it? Rosa from the city. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? Good. Um, good. <laughs> so I'm hearing from construction workers who don't understand why they're still building luxury condos and offices. They're cramming into an elevator to go up 50 stories to work on a luxury condo right now. And they want to know why the DOB is not shutting down sites, including sites with reported positive cases. Why should construction on these sites, these kind of sites, be continuing why aren't you instructing DOB to shut down building on sites like that? Uh, Rosa, we are working within the parameters of uh, the state emergency order. Uh, this is something I know, like every other piece of the equation, that's being constantly assessed. 
uh, and I care about the safety of those construction workers, and I want to be very clear, uh, if any construction worker is sick, they should stay home. If anyone gets sick on the job, they need to get immediately home, or if it's something urgent, of course, to care. Uh, but right now, the state guidance, and this is true in California, to the best of my understanding, it was certainly true in San Francisco, but the guidance was to continue uh, that work because it is outdoors, because clearly any part of the economy can still allow people to have a livelihood that's so important as we see so many other people losing their livelihood. Uh, and because a lot of what is constructed obviously is crucial to our future. You and I would agree that luxury condos are not the priority in this city, but there's a lot of other things being worked on that are important because we will come out of this crisis uh, and we will be playing the long game as Commissioner Shea said. So as I understand it, that is the state guidance at this moment, and I believe it is the same in California, but it's something we're going to monitor all the time. And if there are specific sites we don't think are safe for specific reasons, we always retain the right uh, to act on those. If there's any particular site you know of, uh, we want to understand that so we can do follow-up inspections right away. Yeah, I do, and I've passed them on to DOB, but just to follow up, do you? I understand that the state does not make any differentiation between essential construction that, you know, it supports infrastructure and things that are, um, you know, like I've referred to, the offices, the, the condos, the, the, I've talked to people who are outfitting corporate offices right now, like that are, that are totally empty, the insides of them. I mean, do you personally think that there should be some differentiation here? Rosa, I want whatever's going to keep people safe, and I'm also concerned simultaneously, obviously, that anyone who can keep making a living within the parameters of the state pause order, uh, that is still has value. So I am moved by your question to say we need to look at any individual situation uh, that might need to be treated differently, and I certainly think it's a very important conversation to us to have for us to have with the state about whether we want to think about differentiation by type of construction. But I'm not offering uh, personal opinions in the middle of a crisis. I, I'm, I'm hearing your question. I think it's a fair question. Best way for us to handle this is to have a real conversation with the state and get us all aligned on how we want to handle this for this coming week. But Rose, I'll say to you and all your colleagues, any rule, any approach you know, could change by the week, by the day, depending on changing conditions. Next, we have Sean from the Daily News. Yeah, thanks for taking my question, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to go back to the possibility of closing some streets to vehicular traffic. Um, are there any details under consideration at this time, like the number of blocks or which parts of the city would be involved that you can share at this time? You know, we, uh, I think some people, I believe Speaker Johnson's one of them, have said look at the model from the Summer Streets program and, you know, consider that as an option. I think that's a, a, a helpful example of something to look at. But I want to emphasize, Sean, we are not acting yet on that. Uh, this is, I wish I could describe to you what we are all doing in terms of the day-to-day, hour-to-hour, constant decision-making, constant adjustment it feels like our, li our lives are one endless conference call uh, these last days. But I say that only to say this point. We are constantly making changes and updates. So what I'm being blunt about is here's how we're starting this coming week. We're starting this coming week with a focus on parks and playgrounds. That's where you go and streets are open as normal. Uh, we're going to see how that goes. We're going to see how enforcement goes. We're going to see how many people come out and how they handle it. If we think... It's smart to open up some alternatives. We're only going to do that when we have a clear plan and we have clear enforcement in place. The last thing I want to do is create new places for people to congregate with no enforcement. That would be absolutely contradictory to uh, the state order. So one thing at a time, we do not have a specific plan for those uh, streets yet. I want to affirm that there is no specific plan. There is no order that's been given, but we are going to consider it. Got it. And um, just briefly, can you, can you say who is kind of um, scrutinizing everything right now? I, get, I take it it's your office, DOT. Is, is city, the city council involved? Can you say who the players are? Yeah, I mean, it's since all of this is kind of run and gun, obviously, because we're dealing with an ever-changing crisis, uh, we certainly we're going to work with the city council. They've had a lot of good ideas. We want to hear with them and they understand their communities. 
We're going to work with DOT, of course. I think Parks obviously has a lot to say, but uh, I'm going to really say uh, health commissioner and police commissioner are going to be the first stops on that discussion because why would we open those streets? Only if we thought it would not endanger people, obviously, so we have to f solve for the negative first. If we think opening up more, or, or I should say closing off streets and opening up those spaces for recreation would create danger, we're not going to do it, plain and simple. We're not going to do it if we think it's going to be a net negative. If we think it might be a positive, we still need an enforcement mechanism. So that's how we're going to start the discussion. You've heard some of the others who will be in it. But I am emphasizing, I want to be crystal clear, not happening unless I say it's happening, and we're going to be working closely with the state to align strategies. So I, I, I want to be really careful in a crisis that an idea is out there. If an idea is out there that I think is absolutely unworkable, I'll say, period, we're not doing that, or we're not doing that you know, in, in the foreseeable future. If an idea is a good and interesting idea like this one, I'll say we're going to consider it. But I don't want people turning, we'll consider it into, oh, this is definitely going to happen because a lot of stuff's not going to happen in this kind of environment. Or we may like an idea, but may turn out to be not workable where we have really sharp health and safety uh, imperatives that we have to meet. So definitely will be considered. Stay tuned, but not happening now. Next up, we have Shana from the Washington Post. Hi. Um, so recognizing that uh, the strategy is to provide tests on a priority basis, has there been thought to testing uh, frontline city workers, NYPD, FDNY, uh, also, I guess, private EMS, um, who are non-symptomatic with the idea that you could take them out of circulation and avoid spreading uh, the virus throughout their ranks? I think, again, I'm, I suspect what the commissioner is about to say is community spread. And, and again, the whole reorientation we've had to go through uh, with a changing reality with how pervasive this disease is becoming. Uh, but Commissioner Barbeau. Right. So the recommendation would be the same. We're not going to be testing asymptomatic individuals, individuals who are symptomatic. We want to make sure that they take themselves out of <clears throat> excuse me, out of circulation as quickly as possible. The reality is that the best way to avoid propagating the illness is to ensure that symptomatic individuals stay home, limit their outside contact to only the most essential uh, activities. If they have someone who can go out for them to get food, medicine, et cetera, that's the best thing. Reminding individuals that 80% of the folks who do develop symptoms will have mild symptoms, and that usually within about seven to 10 days, those symptoms will resolve. We want people to then come back to work seven days after onset, onset of symptoms, three days after their fever has gone, whichever is longest, but the most important thing is to, for symptomatic individuals to stay out of circulation, whether or not they are first responders, because the, the reality is that when we've got widespread community transmission, uh, it's implicit that anybody you can, can, can come in contact with who is not one of your household members, you have to assume that they are symptomatic, and that's why we want to make sure that people stay at least six feet apart. Shana, I'd also say, you know, we're, we're still in a situation of tremendous scarcity with testing. Um, if that situation changed profoundly, we'd look at, again, I don't think it'll ever have the same strategic impact it would have, uh, you know, a month or more ago. But I, I, I think it's a common sense point, and the commissioner can speak to this, that you know, if, you, if you had endless testing capacity, you still have the challenge that uh, uh, negative today could be a positive tomorrow. And it's, I think the symptoms, at least I believe, Commissioner, this is what our healthcare leadership believe, uh, since the jury's still out on asymptomatic transfer, the symptomatic people are the folks that we know for sure there's a concern, much greater likelihood of spread and that is dispositive. If someone's symptomatic, they're symptomatic. I mean, that's something we know tangibly in a way that even testing uh, might not give us the clearest picture. Is that I, I'm trying as a layman. Right. No, I think that's a good point. I think for the foreseeable future, I don't see a scenario where we get 
real-time results back. And so any delay in someone taking themselves out of circulation then unnecessarily exposes other individuals to potentially contracting the illness. Whereas symptoms are visible and immediate and exactly. you know what you're dealing with. It's yep. kind of common sense. Go ahead. Next, we have Sydney from Gothamist. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, Sydney with Gothamist. So um, just going back to the releasing people from city jails that I know a few people have touched on here. Um, you said that you're, you're identifying, you've identified another 200 that you hope to release. And so I know that the Board of Correction has identified hundreds of, of people who are older than 50 with underlying health conditions in jail for technical reasons. But 551 of those are in DOC custody serving a city sentence of one year or less or under one year for low-level offenses. And uh, my understanding is that you know, they've, they've called on you as a mayor to use your executive power to release those people. That's 551. So where are you getting the 200 number from? And could you elaborate a little bit on um, how many people you hope to be able to release beyond those 200? Sydney, no. Uh, I'm going to be straightforward with you. We do not have a magic number at this point. This is something we've never dealt with before. And Commissioner Shea... First Deputy Mayor Foulihan, his Chief of Staff Freya Real, uh, Liz Glazer, our uh, Director of Office of Criminal Justice. We're all trying to create a new approach here from scratch. We're all talking rapidly, uh, constantly trying to figure this out. There is not a perfect target number. The Board of Corrections letter uh, gave uh, one uh, interpretation of reality. I respect the board. Uh, but I don't think it was the most complete explanation of what's really going on. Within each of those categories, there are real variations uh, and real differences from inmate to inmate in terms of criminal record and other factors. So it's just not bluntly as simple as that letter portrays. The group of 200 is the next pool, if you will, of people we are considering. I am not saying we're going to uh, release X amount or Y amount, I'm saying we have 200 we're looking at right now that we're going to decide by tomorrow, and then it's just going to be constantly rolling. But we have to do, a, uh, I think it's a very complex equation because we need the right kind of monitoring and supervision. We have to make sure that's there. We need to ensure uh, that people we're releasing, we feel relative comfort. Uh, are not likely to reoffend or do serious crimes because we have to balance all of the factors here and the health conditions of people, absolutely crucial factor. Um, but there's a deep concern that we not create a situation that we are uncomfortable with in terms of the ability to know what the outcomes will be because you don't want to create a new problem trying to solve an original problem. And we have to take the public safety uh, elements into account. It's very thorny, it's, uh, uh, but one thing we know is we have to move quickly and we will. Okay, and, and so just to follow up on that, um, the latest understanding I have is that there are 38 people who tested positive uh, for the virus in city jails. That's a, that's a combination of um, staff and uh, detainees. And so I'm wondering, do you uh, know the extent of the spread that is already existing in city jails? And do you know across which city jails that is? Is it beyond Rikers? I don't have that in front of me. I don't know if the commissioner, Commissioner Barbeau, knows if it's just Rikers or beyond Rikers. I think you've answered the point, obviously, numerically. We know the number of people who have tested positive, and we know, obviously, uh, as with the whole city, there are going to be some people who have not yet uh, shown symptoms but uh, are positive. But I, I, we don't have a perfect model for this. We know it's an urgent matter by definition, just the nature of incarceration. Um, so this is, uh, again, it's a tough, tough equation we have to work through very, very quickly. Uh, but we're all working together to get these answers and make decisions quickly, uh, particularly for folks. We, anyone we think there's a particular medical vulnerability, that will be the front of the line. We don't have information about whether it's Rikers or beyond, but we can get back to you on that. Last up for today, we have Yoav. Um, hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, um, I wanted to ask uh, two questions about the testing priority. Um, 
one of them is just based on the number of confirmed cases, the percentage of uh, people under 50 who have been confirmed. It, it comprises 56% of the confirmations. I'm trying to understand, given the criteria for getting tested, how so many people under 50 would have even been tested uh, um, at this point, because I thought the initial criteria was uh, being over 50 with um, preconditions, and now it's largely people who are either hospitalized or might require hospitalizations, if, if I got that correct. So, um, yeah, I, I guess wh why would so many people under 50 have, have been tested at this point? I'll, I'll start and I'll turn to Commissioner Barbeau. Uh, Yoav, I think, you know, you've seen it that in the course of the last few weeks, we've been rapidly evolving and changing from a situation where uh, it seems like a very quaint time long, long, long ago, but it was only a few weeks ago, where we were still trying to get testing in when it could have had a more strategic impact. And, you know, we would talk about, uh, you know, a handful of cases in a day. I think it's fair to say that the testing uh, prioritization has changed radically over the last days in particular. Um, and uh, remember that a lot of folks early on were getting testing, uh, you know, from different parts of our community without that prioritization. So I think that's part of it. Um, the uh, what we're seeing again on the difference between who's been tested versus who's been hospitalized is striking. Uh, that we, and obviously who is in most danger in terms of you know, preserving their lives. The fact that 35% of the hospitalizations are folks over 70, more than three times the representation of that group in the population. The fact that we've seen no deaths in people between zero and you know, birth, I should say, and 44 years old. Uh, you know, it keeps confirming that we need to shift as much of our focus as humanly possible to protecting folks who are older and have those pre-existing conditions. Now, I'll say it, and the commissioner will say it better than me. There are people uh, under 50 with pre-existing conditions that we clearly are concerned about, and that's a group of people that obviously there are situations where they absolutely need to be tested. But I think the answer is that where we started, you know, a few weeks ago versus where we are now, it's a much tighter prioritization now. And I think as you see testing levels going forward, they will follow that prioritization more and more. I think that's right, Mr. Mayor. We, through the course of the changing nature of this outbreak, have been uh, adapting, if you will, to the changes that came down from the CDC in terms of testing recommendations. I think that there are a lot of people who, in the early period, were getting the message, get tested, get tested, we're trying to change not only provider behavior, but also New Yorker behavior and having people feel comfortable with the fact that as we are in a greater proportion of people having uh, COVID-19, meaning widespread community transmission, that the importance of being tested goes down ever more unless you are in one of those priority categories. And even though we've said, you know, greater than 50 with those five pre-existing conditions, I think the reality is that there are many New Yorkers who may be less than 50 and have those chronic conditions. So I think what we're seeing is a shift in changing behavior between New Yorkers, providers, uh, and the avail availability of testing. And so my hope is, and we're trying to put measures in place, that over time we will see an increase in testing of older individuals and a decrease in that younger age group. Though certainly it is up to provider discretion if they have patients they feel are not getting better. Because again, we don't want to completely discourage people from getting tested if indeed they are not getting better after three or four days of being home um, sick. Okay, thank you. And just along the same lines real quickly, um, there was a photo by my colleague, um, uh, David Goodman, um, our, our colleague, I guess I should say, um, outside of Elmhurst Hospital, of people waiting to get tested at the tent. And it, it looks like there's a good 50 to 80 people out there and uh, standing in line. 
And this was after the the change that, that focused on testing the folks who are hospitalized or, or kind of severely ill who might require hospitalization. So I, I guess my question is, it, it, am I to assume that, that everyone out there, you know, meets that criteria? And if so, I guess I'm just wondering if, if that is the best method to, to test people who, who might be severely ill. Yoav, let me jump in on that and then Dr. Katz. It's a very good question. I don't, I don't you know, we're trying our damnedest to take an immense amount of information and make it clear. And sometimes I think we uh, don't fill in the blanks as well as we need to. So I'm glad you raised this. Uh, but I think we've said it in press conferences, but not nailed it really as clearly as it needs to be. Priority people, that means, you know, folks who were really worried about uh, their fundamental health and their potential, obviously, of severe, severe ramifications. That's not, generally speaking, folks who are younger and healthier, uh, but folks who could easily end up hospitalized or, God forbid, even in danger for their lives. That's one of the priorities for testing. But the other thing that we've said over recent press conferences is to relieve pressure on emergency rooms appropriately, where people are coming in with specific situations that are worthy and need to be addressed, and we're trying not to let the emergency room be overloaded. Uh, we have the folks outside emergency rooms who are turning away folks who do not need to be there at all, or diverting them to another location where they should be, but also the testing capacity to protect the emergency room's ability to serve people who need it most. So Mitch will speak to that, but I also want to note to Mitch and to everyone, you know, even in a situation like that where we're trying to make sure we're serving people, if the wrong kind of lines develop, and this is something Dermot and I have spoken about, uh, we understand there will be lines some places in New York City if folks are waiting to go to a grocery store or pharmacy in some places or to get tested. Lines need social distancing. You know, we don't like lines at all. I think Dr. Barbeau does not like any kind of line, but if you have a legitimate line, uh, you know, we need social distancing in the line. And there may be times when PD, for example, says about something, you know, we don't, we don't think this is a smart way to do this line and we want people to go away and come back later. There's different ways we'll deal with it. But for that specific situation, let's presume our friends at Health and Hospitals would be very careful to do line management. Uh, Mitch Katz, please explain for that line why uh, folks there are being tested and how that fits with keeping your emergency room going. Yes, sir. When we opened up the tent, we gave tremendous relief to the emergency department so that they could focus on the sickest patients. Those patients were com previously coming forward. And of course, everyone has to be assessed because some people really do need to be emergency care. But the tent has allowed us to have them be mild illness to be assessed in a different place to not take up the emergency room time. I'll add that in that picture your colleague took, you'll notice that the people online are all wearing masks. Um, and we put the we give people who are standing on that line a mask in order to decrease the chance that they will cough or sneeze on anybody else. And of course, it's also much better for them to be online in the outside with the free air than sitting in a waiting room in a closed hospital. Well said, Dr. Katz. With that. Thank you, everyone. I hope uh, we were able to share a lot of helpful information, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.